Hey everyone, this is Vishnu Vijay, ACCA, a proud friend trammer who's been teaching students across the globe, across designations. And I welcome you all to another session of the performance management paper. In this session, we'll be starting off with a new syllabus area and with some really interesting set of topics as well. And uh, let's, let's, let's talk more on that particular uh, syllabus area, shall we? We're starting off with part B of the syllabus, specialist cost and management accounting techniques. So folks, when it comes to this particular syllabus area, the good news is that there won't be any section C questions tested from this particular syllabus area. Okay, folks, uh, and as in there won't be any case study question or 20 mark question as such. However, there will most definitely be MCQs or OTQs, which is basically section A and section B type questions from this particular syllabus area. And uh, it's majorly calculation based, uh, a calculation based set of topics, right? And it's all about certain costing techniques that we use uh, to determine the price of our product or determine the cost of our product, basically. Okay, folks, so that's basically as to what we will be learning throughout this particular syllabus area. And in this session, we will be covering uh, from the basics, okay, folks, so from, from the scratch, I would say. We will first of all understand what is costing its uses and all those things, right? And then we will learn about the costing techniques as well. One second, yeah, there we go. And then we will learn about the costing uh, techniques such as the traditional method of costing known as uh, absorption costing. And then there is under or over absorption as to what, uh, you know, what that particular concept is. And then uh, there's another method of, another alternative method to the traditional method of costing, which is known as marginal costing as well. We will learn more about that. We will learn about profit reconciliation. We will look at the modern method of costing known as uh, ABC or activity based costing as well. We will compare the traditional method with the modern method because you know if we already have a traditional method then why exactly is there a modern method isn't it? So that's a question that you may have isn't it? So we will be covering that particular aspect in this particular uh, topic and then we will also look at the advantages and disadvantages of ABC as well. Okay, folks, because you know, not all methods have, uh, you know, not all methods are perfect. Okay, folks, there are some, you know, advantages to it as well as some disadvantages to it as well. So we have to learn those, you know, to tackle some questions that can come up in the exam. Okay, folks, and speaking of the exam, remember guys, you know, uh, and I'm, I'm saying this because there are a few calculation based topic with it when it comes to this particular session. Uh, and uh, yeah, when it comes to the PM paper, there's I, 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 I'm saying this again, there's a common misconception that this is a calculation based paper, but that's not actually the case. Okay, folks, so PM is basically 50% calculation and 50% theory as well. Okay, folks, so theoretical questions can also be tested even from these syllabus area. So when I talk about, let's say, absorption costing or ABC costing, I will be discussing about the calculations and what is a step-by-step -step method to do the calculation. But this is not a mathematical exam, isn't it? So there are some theoretical aspects in relation to these topics as well. So it is really, really important to learn these. Okay, folks, you will understand is one we, you know, once we practice a few questions in relation to these as well. Okay, folks, now. Uh, yeah, another aspect is that you may have already learned about some of these topics through various other uh, degree programs or professional courses like Indian ZA, CPA, etc. as well. Uh, however, yeah, the concept is kind of the same, kind of the same, right? But when it comes to, or, you know, ACC, they have a specific method of testing these concepts. So my objective here is to refresh your memory, like for those who have already learned about this concept, you, uh, you, you can refresh your memory regarding the concept once again, and you can also understand, you know, how these questions will be tested when it comes to the, uh, you know, PM exam. Okay, folks, so remember that. So, uh, yeah, that's basically all I wanted to, you know, uh, say before we start off with, the, with, with this particular topic. So let's get started with the first uh, topic that is costing. Costing is kind of an easy, easy process, I would say. And uh, the objective of conducting the costing methods is basically to determine the price or cost of, you know, the products or services that we are, you know, selling as a business organization. Okay, folks, that's basically the overall objective here. And uh, yeah, although it is, uh, and why, why did I say determine the price? Because, you know, if you look at this particular sentence right here, costing is the process of determining 
the price, the cost of uh, product, services, or activities, isn't it? That's basically what is mentioned over here. But why did I mention price exactly? Because, uh, guys, if you think about it, what is the selling price of a particular product? Let's say that I am, uh, I am, let's say, uh, manufacturing a particular product. Let's say calculators, right? That's uh, one second. Calculators. So uh, that's something that is used by a lot of ACCA students to do some mathematical calculations and stuff like that, isn't it? Uh, when it comes to their exams and even, you know, se for, for several accountancy provisions and several college students, etc. Right. So uh, if I am manufacturing, uh, let's say, calculators as a business organization, then this particular product of mine should have a selling price, isn't it? Right. A selling price needs to be determined for my product. So how will I determine my selling price? That's a curious question, isn't it? Because when manufacturing calculators, there would be a certain amount of cost that I have incurred, isn't it? So each unit of my calculator should cover the cost plus a profit element as well, right? So this is basically my selling price, isn't it? So the selling price is basically the cost of manufacturing that particular product, not just manufacturing, there are a few other costs as well. So the cost that is incurred by my business to, ma uh, to sell this particular product, plus a particular profit element as well, because I can't sell at cost. What, do, what would that mean? That would basically means that I've incurred, let's say, uh, you know, uh, $100,000 to manufacture my particular product, and I'm getting it, getting it back from my customers, isn't it? That's basically it. That's what happens when, I, when I'm selling at my cost. Am I, be am I benefiting anyhow? No, not really, isn't it? Because I've, I've invested 100,000 and I'm getting back 100,000, isn't it? That's basically, it. there's no you know, profit element to it, isn't it? So there's no, uh, there's no logic behind you know, selling at cost, isn't it? Which is, by, which is why I need to add a profit element to my selling price as well. So if I'm investing $100,000, then I should be, I should be expecting uh, to get maybe uh, let's say uh, $150,000 in uh, as a return, isn't it? As a, uh, you know, as revenue, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here, guys. Okay, folks, so when we're manufacturing something or when we're planning to sell a particular product, then the selling price should include both the cost plus a profit element to it as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea. Now, uh, what, uh, so, now we understood as to why we are determining uh, the cost of certain products and activities, isn't it? So, uh, you know, there's another concept that another terminology that you need to know known as standard cost as well. So what is a standard cost of a product? A standard cost is a predetermined unit cost. You folks, a predetermined unit cost set under specified working conditions. So what happens here is, we conduct planning activities within our organization, isn't it? So before actually manufacturing my calculators, what I'm going to do is I'm going to plan for it. Okay, folks, so first of all, I'll assess the demand for my calculators. How many people are expected to buy my calculators within the market? Okay, folks, I'll determine that first of all. And then I'll determine, you know, how many units should be manufactured, right? So all these planning activities are conducted. I, I forecast the demand. I plan for the number of units that needs to be produced. How many units are already in inventory, right? All these things are planned. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to provide an ex expectation of the cost that will be incurred. Okay, folks. That's basically how you set the selling price ultimately. Okay, folks. So at the planning stage itself, we uh, we plan for the expected uh, units that are needed to be produced and we plan for an expected cost as well or a predetermined cost as well and that particular cost is known as standard cost so remember that uh, it's basically you know, uh, you know the cost that we're expecting to produce the particular product that's basically all all, all there is to it under a certain working conditions okay folks we're not expecting any you know, uh, machine breakdowns or delays or anything like that. We're, we're, you know, we're expecting a reasonable working environment and, uh, you know, expecting as to how many units can be produced and what is the cost that will be incurred per unit produced as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically the overall idea behind standard cost. You will, of course, learn more about this particular topic in the upcoming sessions as well. Now, uh, moving on. 
So what are the uses of costing? Well, we have already understood that it can definitely help in determining the selling price more appropriately, isn't it? Because if we have the accurate amount of cost, then all we have to do is we just have to add a profit element to it and determine the selling price, isn't it? So that's one of the uses. Uh, uh, but what else? What else can be done? <clears throat> well, we could conduct planning and controlling activities with costs. How is that possible? Well, we have learned about standard costing as to, standard, as to what standard costs are, isn't it? What is it? It's basically predetermined cost. So I'm going to plan a certain amount of cost expectation for the number of calculators that I'm producing. Okay, folks, let's say that I've planned that. What can actually happen might be something different. For example, I may expect my overall production to cost about, overall production of calculators, calculators to cost about $100,000. However, when I actually conduct the manufacturing process, it may increase or decrease. Okay, folks, it could go, bo it could go both ways. Okay, folks, it could either increase or decrease. So, I planned something, but what has actually happened is something different, isn't it? So it, uh, I may have expected to produce my particular product for $100,000, but I may have manufactured it for, let's say, $110,000 or maybe $90,000 as well. So there has been a variation, isn't it? There has been a variation between the planned activities as well as the actual activities as well. So what we're going to do is, we're going to compare these two, compare the plan cost with the actual cost, identify the variance, and then we investigate into it. Okay, folks, this is known as controlling, isn't it? So costing can be helped to, can help us to plan the expected amount of cost of a particular product. And of course, it can help us to control the cost to a certain extent as well. So that's basically as to why it is uh, why it is used for planning and controlling. Okay, folks, what is planning? Planning things in advance, as we clear. But what is controlling? Comparing planned activities with what has actually happened, identify deviations or variances, investigate into them, and take corrective action, isn't it? So that's basically as to what controlling is, to put it very simply, isn't it? You may have learned this in multiple other, uh, you know, courses or uh, degrees as well, isn't it? So remember that. Okay, folks, so that's one of the uses. Secondly, it helps in performance measurement. What is the difference between performance management and performance measurement? Well, performance management is basically managing the performance of a particular business organization to help it uh, uh, to help that particular organization to achieve its objectives, isn't it? Corporate objectives, isn't it? However, performance measurement is slightly different. Okay, folks, performance measurement is measuring the level of performance or measuring the extent to which the company has performed to achieve its objectives. One is, uh, you know, performance management is managing the performance, whereas performance measurement is measuring the performance, as it is obvious from the terminology itself, isn't it? So we uh, we have an entire new, uh, entire, not new, I would say, yeah, an entire syllabus area dedicated to performance measurement itself. We'll learn about a lot of ratios and a lot of calculations over there as well. However, uh, when it comes to costing, what, what does performance measurement uh, have to do with costing exactly? What is it, what are, what, why exactly are we using it for costing purposes? Well, costing quantifies the values of inventory or, you know, the products that we're producing, isn't it? So that can help us in certain ratio calculations and stuff, isn't it? That's basically all there is to it. Okay, folks, so it can help us or costing can help us Measure, to, measure the extent to which we have achieved our objectives. Because what do we do or, or wh where exactly does performance measurement come into play? Let's, let's understand that, shall we? So I'm just going to uh, highlight that particular concept to you as well. So first of all, every organization will have an objective, right? The corporate objective, which is basically the long-term objective of the organization. And uh, in order to achieve this objective, we may have to implement certain strategies to excel in some critical success areas, okay, folks, or critical areas of the business. And we call these areas to be CSFs, okay, folks, or critical success factors. Now, if we excel at our critical success factors, we achieve the objective. But a question comes up as to 
why exactly or how exactly how exactly can I know if I have excelled in a critical success factor or not? This is where KPIs come into play. Okay, folks, what are KPIs? KPIs are key performance indicators. Okay, folks, and what's it, what is its role here exactly? Key performance indicators are some ratios or uh, measures that can measure the extent to which we have, you know, we have excelled in a particular critical success factor. Okay, folks, that's basically as to what these are. So, if we, uh, so performance measures comes under these KPIs, okay, folks. So, there would be some, uh, this, these measures can be anything. It could be some basic, you know, ratio analysis stuff like the gross profit margin or net profit margin. It could be return uh, to capital employed, right? It could be a liquidity ratio, so like current ratio, quick ratio, etc. But more than about that, it can also be things like energy savings, like uh, energy savings or CO2 emissions or, uh, you know, cost savings, right? How, how much have we, uh, how much efficiently have we saved our cost and all those things? Okay, folks, so all those things can come under KPIs. So, uh, you know, costing can also help in performance measurement if we have certain KPIs like, you know, cost savings or cost efficiency or stuff like that. Okay, folks, so that's basically the overall idea. We'll learn about more about performance measurement later in the course. Okay, folks, so don't worry about that. And uh, the next aspect is inventory valuation, isn't it? If we are able to determine a cost for our particular product, then valuing inventory would also be made easy. And if that's easier, then accounting aspect can also be simplified to a certain expen extent as well, isn't it? So that's basically the overall idea behind costing. Okay, folks, basically a simple concept determining the cost of certain products, services, or activities that the businesses conduct. And, you know, the uses involved uh, for planning and controlling activities, for performance measurement, for, uh, yeah, for inventory valuation, and accounting simplification as well. Okay, folks, simple as that, isn't it? That's basically as to why we do uh, what costing is and where we use it. Okay, folks, remember that. Now, moving on to some costing techniques. Okay, folks, so we've learned as to what costing is and, you know, where we use it, but how exactly is that process conducted? How exactly do we determine the cost of a particular product? Let's learn about that, shall we? So let's first of all learn about the traditional method of costing known as absorption costing. So before jumping into this, I'd like to explain a few concepts. Okay, folks, so normally we would have learned about where the cost is taken into consideration, isn't it? So if you are familiar with the accounting principles, then you would know the structure of a PL uh, account, or in other words, uh, as we call it, the statement of profit or loss, isn't it? So how, how is the pro statement of uh, profit or loss, or in other words, income statement structured? Well, first of all, there would be the revenue, right? And then we're going to deduct the cost of goods sold to get the gross profit, isn't it? And then from the gross profit, we're going to deduct uh, the expenses, add any income if we have any, right? Indirect income, right? In indirect income and indirect expenses. And that will give us the net profit, isn't it? So this is basically the structure that we already know that we would have learned in our in various accountancy courses, isn't it? However, when it comes to PM, you have to think a bit differently. Okay, folks. So we're going to focus more on the split that is there in COGS. What is a commonly known split? Well, uh, how is COGS calculated? We would have learned about that as well, isn't it? It's basically opening inventory plus purchases minus closing inventory, isn't it? So this is basically the equation that we've learned, isn't it? And this particular equation is relevant when it comes to the PM paper. However, for certain particular concepts, such as absorption costing, you have to think differently. Okay, folks, how, how to think, think differently? I'll just quickly explain that. So you have to consider costs into two categories. Okay, folks, there would be direct costs and indirect costs. What are direct and indirect costs? 
Direct costs are those costs which are directly attributable to the particular product. The folks which are directly attributable to the particular product. And what about indirect cost? That's kind of obvious, isn't it? It's basically something that is indirectly attributable, not directly attributable to the product. So what exactly is the idea behind this? Or why exactly are we learning the, uh, you know, cat this particular categorization? Because the new, uh, you know, form that you have to learn would be, yeah, uh, before that, I'll talk about another categorization where it can also be, or costs can also be categorized as fixed costs and variable costs. So what is the idea behind fixed and variable costs? So there are, uh, you know, we may plan to produce different amounts of units in different financial years, right? For example, in this year, I may plan to produce, let's say, 100 units of calculators, whereas in the next year, I may plan to produce 200 units of calculators or even more or less, depending on the demand and all those stuff, right? So uh, when manufacturing at different levels, if I may manufacture at, you know, 100 units or 150 units or 200 units. So uh, if the cost varies along with these different levels, like if I'm, uh, let's say if I'm manufacturing 100 units, then the cost would be $150. Okay, folks? Or let's say $100 itself. And if, uh, if I produce 150 units, then the cost would be $150 itself. So like this, if the cost varies at different activity levels, we call this as activity levels, okay, folks? If cost varies along different activities levels, then we call it as variable cost. However, if cost is fixed, okay, folks, if the cost doesn't increase uh, to 150 and stays at $100 at even if we produce 150 units, then we call them fixed cost as well. And there are also semi-variable or semi-fixed cost as well, which is kind of a mix of both, but you will learn about that later, okay, folks? So, yeah, that's basically uh, another concept that you have to understand here. Okay, folks, what is fixed and variable cost? Variable cost will vary depending on the activity level, whereas fixed cost, you know, is like fixed. It's, it's rigid, isn't it? It doesn't change along with the activity levels. Now, these two categorizations are really important when it comes to this uh, particular absorption cost. Okay, folks. So uh, another concept that you, uh, you have to learn is uh, regarding indirect cost itself. We have an, another name for indirect cost known as overheads. Okay, folks, indirect costs are also known as overheads. It's denoted by this particular sign, OH. Okay, folks, so uh, that's, that'll be a common sign that I'll be using throughout the lecture. So uh, yeah, just, just keep that particular point in mind. So why are we learning about all these things? Well, we will understand that once we get into, you know, absorption costing majorly. Okay, folks, so uh, in absorption costing, what we're trying to do is we are, again, trying to determine the cost of the product, isn't it? So the cost, uh, as per uh, absorption costing principles, the cost of the product includes the direct cost as well as the indirect cost as well. So the direct cost are those costs which are directly attributable. And I'll give you some examples here. Some examples of direct cost would be uh, the material cost. You can type it over here. Yeah. Material cost. As well as there is the labor cost as well. Right. So what is material cost? Basically the raw materials. Okay, folks, raw materials used to manufacture the particular product. Those are directly attributable to the product, isn't it? So the raw materials of uh, the calculators can be directly, uh, you know, attributable to the calculators itself. If I'm manufacturing certain other projects, uh, certain other, uh, you know, products, like let's say watches or uh, maybe clocks, something like that, then the raw material that I'm purchasing for these particular product can be directly attributable, isn't it? I know where I'm using the raw material, so it is directly attributable. And same goes for labor as well, isn't it? Because, uh, you know, laborers will be working on one particular product, so it, we can directly relate to, uh, I, can, I can take a look at the uh, time sheets from factories where, where the calculators were manufactured, and I could easily trace out who all worked for this particular product 
for uh, how many hours and all these things, right? So labor costs are also directly attributable. But there are certain other costs. For example, let's say that, you know, my business, which manufactures calculators, own several factories. Hey folks, in one particular factory, I am manufacturing, uh, 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 this, let's say that this particular fact, uh, factory is rented out by my organization, right? So I'm manufacturing two products in that particular factory, okay, folks, the calculators as well as watches as well. So now think about it. Is the rent expenses attributable to any of these products? Ideally, it should be, isn't it? So it's not directly attributable though. Because if I have a rented factory and I'm manufacturing two products within that particular factory, which product should, buy, should I apportion the factory rent cost to? Because I need to get my rent cost reimbursed through revenue, isn't it? Because these, this particular rent expenses are also a cost that should cover, cover in, uh, or that should be included within my ultimate product as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. So how is that apportioned? This is where absorption costing comes into play. Okay, folks, so uh, in, there's, the challenge behind indirect cost is that it is not directly attributable. So what we have to do is, through these absorption costing techniques and several other techniques, we will have to apportion the cost. Okay, folks, apportion overheads to the specific product. Okay, folks, so that is basically what we do in absorption costing. What are we doing here? I'll repeat again. We're apportioning the, a portion of the uh, overhead expenses that I have in my business to the product that I'm selling. Simple as that. Okay, folks. So let's get back to uh, absorption costing real quick, shall we? So it is a, uh, now it, it'll be easy, easily understandable uh, once we read this particular definition. Now, uh, what is the idea here? Absorption costing is the form of costing in which the cost of products are calculated by adding an amount of indirect product cost or overheads to the direct cost of production. Simple as that, isn't it? How is the, what is the cost, what does the cost of a particular product include as per absorption costing? The direct cost as well as the indirect cost. But the challenge with indirect cost is that it's not directly attributable, so I may have to apportion those costs to, to my, uh, apportion a portion of that particular uh, cost to my product. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. So this can be uh, conducted in three steps majorly, right? Step one is to, uh, you know, the overheads are first of all allocated or apportioned to cost centers. So what we're going to do is we're going to categorize our uh, overheads within my business organization into cost, something called cost centers. There would be production cost centers as well as service departments as well. For example, let's talk about the factory example itself, right? Within my factory, I'm manufacturing, uh, manufacturing, let's say, you know, calculators and watches, right? And, uh, you know, th they're factory workers itself, so they do take these breaks and everything. They do uh, need to eat something during their lunch break as well, right? So therefore, uh, you know, I also have a cafeteria in my factory. Okay, folks, so this cafeteria, it does have certain, you know, for me as a business owner, I will incur some sort of expense in, you know, having that particular cafeteria in my factory, isn't it? So shouldn't that also be a portion to my product? Because through revenue, okay, folks, remember this, guys, through revenue, I am getting all my costs reimbursed plus a profit element, isn't it? That's basically how it, how it works. Okay, folks, that's basically how you have to think about it. Okay, folks, so... When it comes to a cafeteria, I do have certain expenses to it and I need to apportion it or I need to include the uh, overheads into each of my products. Okay, folks, that's that's another thing that we do as well. So uh, this isn't something that is, uh, the, uh, the cafeteria is not involved in the production process in any way, right? It is just a service department. Okay, folks, they, they provide, you know, lunch or, uh, you know, something to eat for the employees that are working within the factories, right? Uh, maybe have a cup of tea or coffee as well, right? So uh, that's basically the overall idea, okay, folks? So I need to apportion uh, a fraction of the uh, cafeteria-related costs as well to my product. So how will I do that? Well, this is basically why we have step one, okay, folks? We categorize the cost centers into, we categorize the overheads, sorry, not cost centers, overheads into cost centers. 
These sub cost centers can be production cost centers as well as service cost centers as well. Now, what is the next step? Step two is where the service center costs are reapportioned to production centers. What are we going to do? We're going to reapportion the service center costs to the production centers. Why? Because service center costs are not directly, cannot be related to the product in any way, isn't it? So we're going to apportion, uh, you know, a fraction of the particular service cost, uh, service cost, sorry, service cost center costs to the production centers as well. And then we move on to step three. And what is step three? Overheads are absorbed into units of pro uh, production using an overhead absorbed rate. What are we doing here, guys? We're absorbing overheads to each individual product, right? Uh, or, or to each unit of my product, isn't it? Simple as that. And uh, we calculate, and, uh, and how exactly is it absorbed? It's absorbed using a rate known as the overhead absorption rate, isn't it? And how is overhead absorption rate calculated? The equation is given right here. We take out the budgeted overheads, right? We take out the total budgeted overheads that we have and divide it with the budgeted activity level. Okay, folks, this particular activity level can be anything. It could be labor hours. It could be machine hours that we use within the organization. It could be uh, the number of units. It could be anything. Okay, folks, the basis should be judgmentally determined. We will look into that. Okay, folks. And uh, of course, theory can, you know, only take you so much, right? So I may have explained a few things here, but, you know, it may not be only maybe like 60% of it would have, you know, gone through your head right now, isn't it? But, you know, with practical, uh, you know, examples, we would, we should be able to understand it completely. Okay, folks, so let's do a question to understand what this process is, how it's done, etc. Okay, folks, so let's take a look at this particular example right here, shall we? So guys, the first thing that you have to remember when you're reading a particular question is that you need to first of all read the requirement of the question. Okay, folks, so every case study question or section C question when it comes to the exam will have a requirement section. Okay, folks, and this particular requirement should be the first thing that you should be reading when it comes to the exam. So what is the requirement here? Using the traditional absorption costing, Calculate the full production cost per unit and profit per unit for each product and comment on the implications. So, how many things should we do in this particular question? Two things? No, not really. Okay, folks, there should be three things that you should be uh, noting down when it comes to this particular question. And remember, guys, whenever you are reading the particular requirement, always look for this particular word and here okay, folks and can always split the requirement into two or more categories okay folks so just remember that particular point uh you have to carefully read the scenario to understand the objective because if your answer is not in line with the requirement then you won't get marks for anything okay folks remember that so uh we have to use the traditional absorption costing to first of all calculate the full production cost per unit what is the full production cost it's basically Direct cost plus indirect cost. That's basically the full production cost, as simple as that. And you have to also calculate the profit per unit for each product as well. All right. And then, of course, there are a few, uh, you know, comments that you can provide with the figures calculated as well. Okay, folks, as simple as that. <clears throat> so let's get started, shall we? So what all information do we have? What is the business scenario? Let's understand that. Willy Wonka, a chocolate, chocolate manufacturer, produce, produces three products. The red, which is basically a bar of solid milk chocolate. The blue, which is a fondant filled milk chocolate egg. And the green, a biscuit and a nugget based chocolate bar. Now I'm feeling a bit hungry, but still, let's go, go on. Uh, now, uh, information related to each of these products are given to us. Okay, so we have the direct labor cost per unit. And is it, is it a direct cost? Well, the name suggests yes, isn't it? We also have direct material cost per unit as well. And then, uh, okay, so we have the direct cost given to us already for each of the product, isn't it? Now, all we have to do is we just have to add the overheads, isn't it? 
But what are the, uh, do we have other information provided to us which can help us with this? Let's see, let's have a look. We have the actual production or sales for the year, let's say. We have the direct labor hours per unit, the direct machine hours per unit, selling price per unit as well. And then we also have the annual production overhead given to us of $80,000 as well, isn't it? So the total overheads are already given to us, isn't it? What else, what else do we have? Do we have any other information? No, it's just a solution, isn't it? Okay, so uh, based on this information, we have to calculate two things. The full production cost per unit. Okay, folks, when it comes to the PM paper, the unit of measure is really important. Okay, folks, so what, what is mentioned in the requirement? We need to calculate the full production cost per unit. Okay, folks, so cost per unit should be calculated, not the total cost itself. For uh, I'll, I'll tell you the difference here. For example, let's say the, let's take these two things. Okay, folks, labor cost per unit. Okay, folks, what, is, what does it say? It is basically the cost of one unit, labor cost of one unit produced, isn't it? However, what about this annual overhead provided over here? Is it the, is $80,000 the overhead cost of one unit? No, not really. If it is the overhead cost of the total number of units produced of all three products. Okay, folks. So we have to calculate, we have to apportion this particular 80,000 to each of the product, red, blue, and green. Okay, folks, that is our objective here. So uh, how do we do that? Well, first of all, we have to create a format for our answer, isn't it? So I'm not going to go into the solution that is already provided into your notes. I'm going to do it in and uh, in the CBE environment, let's say, okay, folks. So not the ACC platform, but a basic Excel sheet, okay, folks. It has kind of have the similar functionality. So yeah, similar but not all functionalities, okay, folks. So remember that. So uh, I have three products with me, right? The red, the blue. And the yellow, no, the green, right? <clears throat> All right. So my objective is to calculate the full production cost and the profit per unit as well, isn't it? So what all information do I have? I have the direct labor cost per unit, isn't it? So I can just simply copy paste this. Should do we do the case? One second. Yeah, there we go. How much is it? Labor cost per unit would be 0 0.05, 0 0.12, sorry, 0 0.1, and then 0 0.8 as well, isn't it? And then we also have the direct material cost per unit. I'm gonna copy paste this as well. So folks, you can definitely copy paste some of some aspect of the answer from the question itself. Okay, folks, that's a, that's an easy way to do it rather than typing everything in, isn't it? So yeah, uh, we have 0 0.15, 0 0.17, whoops, wrong place. And 0.14, there we go. What else? Uh, so, yeah, we also had the selling price as well, isn't it? Because we know that selling price minus direct and indirect cost would give us profit. Okay, folks, as per the PM concepts, that's basically how you should uh, think about it. Okay, folks, uh, selling price minus, uh, as we learn, it, it's kind of the, you know, reverse, uh, it's kind of the reverse equation that we learned earlier, isn't it? Because earlier, we learned that selling price equals cost plus profit, isn't it? So now I'm just reversing the equation. Profit equals selling price minus cost. As simple as that. Okay, folks. Now, uh, yeah, what is the selling price per unit? I just copy paste it, but yeah, stop. Uh, it is basically 0 0.55 and then 0 0.45 and then 0 0.50 as well. Isn't it? Simple as that. So I have the selling price as well as the cost. What's next? I need to add on the indirect cost, isn't it? How will I do that exactly? Well, first of all, I need to calculate the overhead absorption rate, isn't it? Right? 
So this would be my, let's say, working one, working note one. This is how you should, you know, present your answers in the exam, just so you know. Uh, so how will we calculate the overhead absorption rate? Hmm, that's kind of an interesting thing to think about, isn't it? What all information do we have? Well, first of all, we learned about step one, two, and three, isn't it? What is step one for absorption costing? To categorize everything into overhead, uh, sorry, production cent cost centers as well as service cost centers, isn't it? And step two was to reapportion the service cost to the production centers as well. But that particular process is already done in this particular question. Okay, folks. So now we move on to step three, which is to calculate the overhead absorption rate. What was the equation? Budgeted overheads, budgeted total overheads divided by budgeted activity as well, isn't it? So do I have the budgeted overheads given to me? Yes, it is, isn't it? That's basically the annual production overheads of 80,000. Okay, folks, so I'm just going to say uh, it is the annual. Why should I type it in when I can copy paste, right? So I'm just going to copy paste this. There we go. This would be 80,000. Always mention the unit of measures, okay, folks. And I have to, de uh, you know, deduct this. Oh, sorry, I have to divide this with the uh, budgeted activity, isn't it? And as I mentioned earlier, budgeted activity can be anything, okay, folks. It could be labor hours, it could be machine hours. So I'm going to take labor hours here, okay, folks. Uh, is that what is taken on the in this particular answer as well? Let's see. Uh, 0 0.01, there we go. Yeah. Okay, so we're taking machine hours, isn't it? Okay, so let's take machine hours. Okay, folks, let's go by this particular, you know, question itself so that we can check the answer finally. Okay, folks, so each basis will give you different answers, you know, uh, however, uh, you know, uh, th that's basically why determining the budgeted activity level is a judgmental process. Okay, folks, remember that. So, let's take the machine hours here. Uh, yeah, so we have the machine hour per unit. However, that's not the total machine hour, isn't it? So how do we calculate that? The total machine hour is not given to us. However, we have two information, isn't it? One is that we have the direct machine hour per unit. Okay, We have hours per unit and we also have the total units as well. So how do I calculate the budgeted machine or total machine hours? How do I calculate the total machine hour here? Well, the equation is kind of easy. You just have to multiply these two, isn't it? Multiply 0.1 with the units, annual production units or sales units, which is 500,000. Same goes for the other two products and then add all these together, isn't it? As simple as that. So I'll first of all multiply 0 0.01 with 500,000. I'll just write the equation over here. 0.01 don't uh, and that's a really important point to note guys because whenever you're doing a calculation within Excel show the calculation or input the formulas okay folks don't just calculate everything in your calculator and then type in the answer okay folks that's not what the examiner wants the examiner would like to see your workings they would like to understand what is the logical approach that you've used etc okay folks remember that so 0 0.01 times 500,000, right? 500, 1, 2, 3. Yeah. I'll just put this in brackets, otherwise, the equation can go wrong. So, always use bracket when it comes to the exam. Okay, folks, I'm going to add this with the next item, isn't it? 0 0.04 times 150,000. I'm going to add another aspect as well, the green one, right? 0 0.02 times 250,000. In your exam, the basis that you have to use will be provided to you. Okay, folks, as to whether it is labor or machine hours, you have to read the scenario carefully to understand that. So, 16,000, isn't it? So, my overhead absorption rate will basically be 
80,000 divided by 16,000, which is $5 per unit, isn't it? Per unit. I need to provide the unit of measure here as well. So dollar per unit. There we go. All right, folks. So this is basically our overhead absorption rate. Now, what do I have to do? So the basis that we are using is basically machine hours, isn't it? So all we have to do now is to provide the overheads over here. And I'll provide another working note. Working note two, which would be my overhead calculation, isn't it? So, yeah, there we go. So how do I calculate my overheads? Well, basically, I have the machine hour per unit for each of these products. I have to multiply each of these with $5. That's basically how you absorb the overhead. Okay, folks, so remember that. So for each unit, I'm, I'm just going to copy paste these values. There we go. I have to copy paste it for each of the product. So I'm just going to copy paste this as well. There is 0 0.01, 0 0.04, and then 0 .0, 0 0.02. So my overheads would now be equal to this value times $5, right? always link the cells in your exams. Okay, folks, that, that can uh, make things easier for the examiner as well. This value times five again over here, and then this value times five. There we go. So these are basically my overhead per unit, isn't it? So what have I done here? I've used the overhead absorption rate to absorb each of my uh, overheads to the particular products that I have over here. Okay, folks, so I'm just gonna link these cells as well, equal to this value, and I can just simply copy paste this. There we go. So I've calculated my full production costs, isn't it? Full production costs per unit would be the sum of these three values, the direct plus indirect cost, as simple as that. Did we get the right answer? Let's check that. Yes, we have, isn't it? So it's kind of the same over 2, uh, 0 0.25, yes, 0 0.47 and 1.04. There we go. So what else? I also need to calculate the profit per unit as well, isn't it? So profit per unit would be selling price minus full production cost. Okay, folks, as simple as that. So the only profit making product would be red, isn't it? All others seems to be, uh, you know, a bit off. So I'm just going to do this. There we go. Yeah. So all other products seems to be making a loss. Why? Why exactly is it a loss? Because the cost exceeds selling price. Isn't it? That's basically the a full production cost exceeds selling price. That's basically the reason. So we're making a loss rather than profit. So I'm just going to retype this to profit or loss per unit. It looks as simple as that. So I've met the first category and uh, sorry, first requirement, right? There was a second part to the requirement as well, isn't it? You have to comment on the implications of the figures as well. So what, what should be the comment? The comment should basically be that we're not entirely covering our cost for blue and green, for the products blue and green. Therefore, we need to maybe increase the selling price, right? All these things could be suggested. Okay, folks, so that's basically the uh, idea here behind comments. It should be simple sentences, okay, folks? They're not expecting too much complex stuff in, in, in this particular exam. But yeah, if you can provide complex uh, explanations or complex findings or observations as well, then that's, a, that's an add-on uh, mark for, the, for your exam. So yeah, 
keep this in mind. So that's basically all about the uh, this particular question. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out as well. Okay, folks. So that's basically uh, all about all about this one. We get the right answers. Let me double check that. 0 0.3, 0 0.02, and point. Uh, this would be 0.54, isn't it? So yeah, there we go. All right. Negative. Uh, yeah, negative. Should be a negative figure. There we go. Yeah. Uh, the calculations were all correct, and I don't see any other issues. Simple as that. Okay, folks, this is basically how you present your answer as well. Okay, folks, so I've noted, uh, you know, I hope you've noted a few things here. I provided my working note references wherever necessary, and I pro uh, provided, you know, everything in different columns. I've bolded my answers that are relevant for the examiner, right? So all these things should be focused on when it comes to your exam as well. Okay, folks, you can also focus on the formatting as well. If you want, you can also highlight your answers if you want, okay, folks, in yellow or some other color if necessary. However, uh, you know, don't don't overdo it, I would say. Okay, folks, you're, you're not planning to draw a rainbow when it comes to the exam. So uh, just keep it professional. Okay, folks, keep your answer professional and present everything uh, in a manner that it's easily understandable for the examiner. Because if the examiner is happy, then you're also happy, right? So yeah, that's basically all there is to it. So uh, this is basically how you should present your answer. And that's basically all about this particular question. So if you add on things, the absorption about the absorption basis, which is basically the uh, budgeted activity level, it can't, uh, you know, it's, it's not just machine hours, you can also use labor hours, right? A percentage of a direct material cost, a percentage of labor cost, a percentage of prime and factory cost as well. So what is prime and factory cost? What do you think? Well, prime costs are basically the direct cost majorly, which is basically the uh, material cost as well as labor cost alone, right? And factory cost could also include the, uh, you know, the entire cost as well. Okay, folks, that's basically the uh, difference between these two terminologies. And then we can also use rate per machine hour, rate per direct labor hour, and rate per unit as well. Rate is, in the sense, dollar per unit as well. Okay, folks, that can also be used as a uh, absorption basis as well. But when it comes to the exam, it's commonly machine hours or labor hours. And in the question, it will be specifically mentioned as to what needs to be used. So read the question carefully. Okay, folks, remember that. So that's basically all about uh, absorption costing and how we do the calculation and everything. Uh, and now we move on to over or under absorption. So what's the idea here? So absorption costing is majorly done at the planning stage, isn't it? When we plan things regarding the particular product, isn't it? However, what can actually happen might be something different, isn't it? So what we're doing here is basically kind of a simple theory, really. All we have to do is we have to compare the absorbed overhead as our plan with the actual overheads. Okay, folks. So if the actual overheads is greater than the already absorbed overheads, then we are under absorbing. Okay, folks, then we are under absorbing. Why exactly is that? Because the actual overheads were, you know, too much, but we've only, uh, you know, absorbed, uh, you know, a little under that, isn't it? So if it's, if the absorbed overhead is under actual overhead, then it, then it is, you know, under absorbed. However, if it's, the, if it's vice versa, okay, folks, if the actual overhead is less than absorbed overhead, then we have over absorbed. Okay, folks, so that's basically the concept here. Okay, folks, over and under absorption occurs when the overhead actually incurred is not equal to the overheads absorbed. Okay, folks, as simple as that. So that's basically a simple concept. Of course, you will be learning more about this in, a, in another question that we will be doing. Uh, and now moving on to another method, first of all, which is known as marginal costing. So when it comes to marginal costing, as I mentioned before, this is an alternative costing method to the traditional method of absorption costing. Okay, folks, so I'll tell you the difference here. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, you can categorize cost into two, in, in two formats. Either it, you can categorize it as direct or indirect cost, or it can also be categorized as fixed and variable cost as well, isn't it? So when it comes to fixed and variable costs, in marginal costing, 
you're only going to consider the variable cost. Okay, folks. So uh, I'll tell you another format that you have to remember when it comes to the uh, for, when it comes to this particular paper. Uh, so the normal format is basically the uh, revenue minus cost of goods sold is gives you profit, and then minus the uh, expenses and uh, adding on income, you'll get the net profit, right? That's basically the usual format that you know. But more and about that, uh, you know, in this particular paper, you will have to learn about this particular format as well. Uh, such as revenue, first of all, there's revenue, and we will deduct the variable cost from revenue. This will give you something known as contribution. Okay, folks, just rewrite this. Looks like a heartbeat, so yeah, contribution. There we go. And if you deduct the fixed cost from contribution, you will get profit. Okay, folks, this is another format that you will have to remember when it comes to marginal costing and several other topics that we will be looking into as well. So uh, that's basically, you know, the idea here. Uh, so when it comes to marginal costing, our focus is on contribution, as in, uh, you know, our primary focus is just on the variable cost aspect alone. We will not be considering fixed cost just yet. Okay, folks. If we have to calculate profit, then most definitely yes, but you know, majorly we're only considering the variable cost. Remember that. And when calculating profit using both these methods, there would be a difference. Okay, folks, there would be a difference in profit when uh, when we calculate it basis the uh, absorption costing method as well as the marginal costing method as well. And uh, a profit reconciliation equation is given. What is profit reconciliation? So since there is a difference, what causes the difference? That's what we're trying to understand here. Okay, folks, what exactly is the cause of difference? So this cause of difference or this particular change in profit can be calculated using this equation that is provided over here, which is basically, I'll just uh, highlight this, there we go. Change in level of inventory times the fixed overhead absorption rate. Why are we multiplying it with the fixed overhead absorption rate? Because in marginal costing, mar marginal costing we didn't take the fixed overhead. Isn't it? So that's basically why, okay, folks. So it's basically the change in level of inventory times the fixed overhead absorption rate. This will give you. So this is basically the uh, you know the fixed overhead absorption element, and this will give you uh, the change in profit. Okay, folks. That's basically uh, that's basically what the cost of the difference is. Because once again, I'll repeat this again for you uh, to avoid any confusion. Right? In marginal costing, we're only really taking variable overheads. Right? And in Absorption costing, we're taking both uh, both these items, right? We're taking both variable overheads as well as fixed overheads, right? So the difference is caused due to the fixed overheads, isn't it? The total fixed overheads, isn't it? And what is the equation for fixed overheads? It's basically fixed overhead absorption rate times the change in level of in the the number of units, right? So uh, since this, we're calculating the change in profit, where we will have to calculate the First of all, calculate the change in inventory units and then the, uh, you know, overhead absorption rate as well. Okay, folks, as, as simple as that. What well, uh, change in inventory level is the difference between the opening and closing inventory. Okay, folks, that's basically the overall idea. So if the opening and closing inventory levels differ, then the profit re reported under two of these methods will also differ. Okay, why exactly is that? Well, uh, uh, and, and and how exactly do we determine as to which one is has higher profit or which method will show a higher profit? Well, if the inventory level increases, then the overhead absorption costing will report a higher profit. What's the idea here, guys? So if the closing inventory is greater than opening inventory, that's basically when there's an increase in inventory, isn't it? An increase in inventory happens when the closing inventory is greater than the opening inventory, isn't it? If that is the case, then absorption costing will report a higher profit. If it's vice versa, if, if opening inventory is greater than closing inventory, then marginal costing will report a higher profit. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. All right, so those are just some you know basic concepts uh, that you have to remember. Of course, when it comes to these equations and everything, we can only understand so much from theory, right? So let's let's do some calculations uh, to understand things in a bit more better format, shall we? So what is this question all about? What is the first thing that we should read here? The requirement, isn't it? And what is the requirement here? We have to prepare 
profit statements for each of the six monthly periods using marginal costing as well as absorption costing. Okay, what are profit statements? Basically, the statement of profit and loss in a different format. Okay, folks, that's basically it. Uh, in the format that we discussed earlier, that's basically the idea. So let's read the scenario and then jump onto the question, shall we? I'll just, uh, yeah, there we go. So direct, uh, sorry, Ray makes and sells one product which has the following standard production cost. We have direct labor provided to us, which is three hours, at, uh, we have the total labor hour per unit provided to us, which is $18 per unit, right? And each unit, okay, folks, what is this information? These sort of information can be really common when it comes to the exam. So uh, how should you interpret it? Well, basically all you have to do is you just have to, <clears throat> you have to interpret, it, interpret it like this. Okay, folks, so one unit will take three hours to manufacture by a laborer and uh, you know each labor is paid $6 per hour that they're working. Okay, folks, that's basically how you should interpret this. And same goes for direct material as well. Okay, folks, we have the total uh, sorry, uh, the material cost per unit, which is $28. And what does this mean? This basically means that 4 kg is used to produce one unit of our output. And then each kilograms of material will cost us $7 per kilo, isn't it? That's basically the idea. Okay, folks. And we also have the variable overhead production, production overheads, and then fixed production overheads as well, which is $3 and $20. And the standard cost per unit is also given to us, which is $69 as well. What else is provided? Well, we also have the normal output, which is six, 16,000 units per annum, right? And variable, it is also mentioned that variable selling distribution and administration costs are 20% of sales as well. This is another element that we have to consider as well, isn't it? Because after calculating the gross profit, there are a few other expenses that we have to deduct to get the profit, isn't it? Uh, that's basically the overall idea. Okay, folks. So fixed selling uh, distribution and administration costs are 18,000, is it 18, sorry, 180,000 per annum. There are no units in the finished goods inventory at 1st October 2000X2. The fixed overhead expense is spread evenly throughout the year. Okay, folks, so it's like divided equally. And then the selling price per unit is also provided to us, which is $140, isn't it? So we also have the production and sales budget, which are as follows uh, for the first six month period of uh, ending 30th June 2003, we have production of 85,000 and sales of 7,000, sorry, uh, 8,500 and 7,000. For the six months ending 31st December 2003, we have 7,000 production, budgeted for production and sales will be 8,000. So based on this, okay, folks, based on this particular figures, we should be able to think out the uh, opening inventory as well as the closing inventory as well. Okay, folks, remember that. All right, moving on. So that's basically all the information. Now let's create the profit statement, shall we? So I'm just going to create a new Excel sheet over here. There we go. And then let's answer it out. Give. Okay. The first thing that I have to do here is to provide the heading, isn't it? So what should be my heading? Should be profit statement for the uh, period ending, say, uh, you know, 30th June 2000X3, isn't it? That should be, uh, well, for the year ending, 30th, 31st December 2000X3, isn't it? So that should be my main heading. I'll just write that down. Or maybe I can just copy paste it from here to save time. There we go. And then we also have, uh, we have to calculate it using two methods. So I'll just write down the first method over here. Is it A and B? Yeah. <clears throat> I just have one product, but you know, I need to calculate this for two periods, isn't it? So the six month for the first period is basically six months ending 30 June 2000X3. And the second month is basically the six months ending uh, 31st December 2000X3 as well, 31st December 2000X3 as well. So I'm just gonna copy paste these as well. This is basically how my answer should be presented. So I'm just gonna design my Excel sheet in the same way as well. Okay, folks, so these two can be merged together. 
you need to have four columns to do my calculations. I'll just lengthen this column as well. <clears throat> all right, so what is the first thing that I need to do? It's a profit statement, so I should first of all state the revenue, isn't it? So what is the sales? Is that given to us? Well, it's not directly given to us, I would say, but we do have the units provided over here as well as the uh, selling price per unit as well, isn't it? So based on this, I will have to calculate the selling price. Well, it's kind of straightforward because I know that the sale, I know the sales number of units over here, 7,000 and 8,000, isn't it? So I just need to write that, out, write that equation down. So the equation would be equal to 7,000 for this particular period times 140, simple as that. And for the next period, it's 8,000, isn't it? So 8,000 times 140. No calculator required. I just simply, simply type down the equation and I'll get my answer, simple as that. Now, uh, what else? It's the marginal costing method. So what should be done? In marginal costing, we're only going to take the variable element, isn't it? So remember that. And what should be my next aspect? After sales, it's usually cost of goods sold, isn't it? However, uh, we're going to split the equation here because we have opening and closing inventory given to us, right? Uh, well, it's not given directly, but we can calculate it. So uh, I'm just going to type in opening inventory purchases or production. Let's type it production. We're not purchasing it, right? So let's type production and then closing inventory. So we are not supposed to type things out here in units, isn't it? Because in the profit statement, there are no units provided to us. It's just values. It's in, it, all the amounts are in dollars, isn't it? So we need to convert everything. Okay, folks, is there any opening inventory uh, during the first period? No, not really. Okay, folks, I'll just correct this. There we go. There is like zero opening inventory over here. What about production? What is the production for the first period? It's basically 8,500, isn't it? And what about the closing inventory? How do we calculate this? That's kind of easy because it's basically the production minus sales, isn't it? How much was the sales? 7,000 for this particular period, isn't it? So 1,500 would be my closing inventory, which basically means that for the next period, my opening inventory would also be 1,500, isn't it? So it's basically all logic, okay, folks? Try to understand the logic and the accounting flow here, okay, folks? That's basically the key. And uh, what is the production for the next period? It's 7,000. How much is sold? 8,000, isn't it? So equal to this value minus 8,000. Oh, sorry, we also have the opening inventory as well, right? So closing inventory would be... <clears throat> equal to this value plus this value minus 8,000. There we go, 500. Okay, folks, simple as that. However, these are units, isn't it? These are not dollars. So what should we do? What we have to do is we have to multiply the number of units with the cost per unit, isn't it? So what is the cost per unit? In marginal costing, we do not take variable overheads. We are, we're only going to take uh, the, sorry, we don't take we don't take fixed overheads. We are only going to take variable overheads, isn't it? So I need to add direct labor cost per unit, direct materials cost per unit, as well as the variable cost per unit, and multiply it with all these number of units provided over here, isn't it? Simple as that. So uh, the first one is simply zero. So I'm, I can just leave that be. For the others, it's basically uh, fourteen. Uh, you know, you can either add these three together or you can just calculate it as 69 minus 20 as well, which, which will basically give me 49, isn't it? However, I have to show the calculation, so I'll just rewrite this into an equation. There we go. Times 69 minus 20. Same goes over here as well. Okay. Okay. 
this is length this should be converted into dollars times 69 minus 40 sorry 20 and the same good go would go over here as well isn't it always add the brackets wherever necessary okay folks that's like really really important when it comes to uh, equations otherwise the equation can go wrong I think there should be a bracket over here as well there we go all right so now we have converted everything into the numbers isn't it or in dollars isn't it so that's basically the idea now moving on what else uh, what else needs to be done There is also a variable selling distribution and administration cost as well, isn't it? So I'm going to add that as well. I'll just add this as a separate line item. But before that, let me just calculate the totals here. Would be sum of these values. You can just copy paste the same equation over here. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, can't, we cannot use the sum function here. Why exactly is that? because inventory should be deducted, right? So I'll just rewrite the equation. It should be sum of these two amounts. Oops, one second. Minus this one. There we go. Yeah, now it's correct. Well, you know what? I don't have to bold this, right? I just need to bold my final answer. Uh, the next aspect would be the variable element, right? So I'll just copy paste this. May have to lengthen this a bit. All right. So what is the variable selling distribution and administration cost? 20% of sales value, isn't it? So I'll just write the equation this uh, the sales amount times 20 percent and the same goes for the next period as well now this should give me my contribution isn't it contribution is basically sales minus variable cost isn't it so i'm just gonna add that equation this minus this amount minus this variable cost there we go so this is my contribution. However, in a profit statement, we have to find the profit, isn't it? So how do we do that? Well, we just have to deduct the fixed cost elements from contribution to identify the profit, isn't it? As simple as that. Okay, folks. So uh, now let's calculate the fixed elements over here. This is not it. One second. Yeah, there we go. We have the fixed production overheads provided to us, which is $20 per unit, isn't it? And then what else do we have? What should we multiply this particular $20 with? Do we have the, well, this is basically the budgeted production, but that's not what we need. We need the actual units. Is the actual units provided to us? Most definitely, yes, isn't it? It's basically provided over here. The normal output is 16,000 units per annum. Okay, folks, so do not do not try to multiply it with these two values over here. Okay, folks, that's wrong. You should multiply it with the actual value. Okay, folks, remember that. So fixed overhead costs would be equal to 16,000 times 20 divided by, because we're calculating it for the six-month period, isn't it? So you have to keep these things in mind. Okay, folks, it's kind of difficult, I know, but with practice, you'll get the hang of it. Uh, you have to divide it by two. And the same would go over here. There we go. And there's one more aspect, isn't it? One more fixed element, the fixed selling distribution and administration costs as well. I'll just paste it over here. How much is that? Are 180,000. Okay, folks, that's like 180,000 per annum, isn't it? And again, we have to divide it by two. Why, exi why exactly is that? 
It's because we're calculating everything for the six month period, isn't it? Simple as that. And this should give us our profit. Type the equations correctly. Okay, folks, we have to deduct these fixed costs from contribution to get my profit, isn't it? I'm just going to calculate this. There we go. And voila, there it is. There it is. Okay, folks, every hand, everything, every number has been calculated. Now I'll just do some basic formatting to make my answer look pretty. That's basically it. Okay, folks, there we go. So simple as that. Okay, folks, so imagine the structure in your head and then, you know, start, start, you know, typing everything in. Okay, folks, because, and it, it'll be really, really, it is really, really recommended to practice a lot of questions like this within the CBE environment in itself so that, you know, you can get the hang of, uh, you know, you can get the hang of typing things in real quick and attending the question within the time allotted. Okay, folks, so remember that. All right, now moving on to another aspect. Question is not over, isn't it? We also have to calculate the fixed, sorry, absorption costing method as well. So, how do we calculate things over here? Well, we can simply copy paste all of these items. First of all, that's the that's the advantage of CBE, I would say, isn't it? You don't have to type everything again or write everything again. You can just simply copy paste. However, not everything can be copy pasted. There are a few uh, changes that we need to do when it comes to the uh, when it comes to the, this particular absorption costing method. So, what are the changes? Selling price is selling. Pr will selling price be different? No, not really. Okay, folks. And what else? <clears throat> the opening inventory values would be different, isn't it? Why? Because now we are considering the fixed cost elements as well, isn't it? And therefore, what's going to happen is we will have to remove contribution because that's not something that we will be calculating anymore. That will show an error. We can fix that later. And then, uh, yeah, this amount would be 69 itself, isn't it? Since we are also including the fixed cost elements. Uh, this would be 69. What else? This is length, so no worries. This would be 69 as well. And same goes for this one as well. All right. So this will be my closing inventory values. Now, what else? I won't be needing to show this item separately now, right? Because I've already included the fixed cost element over the inventory as well. So yeah, I don't need to calculate that. But what else do I need to calculate? When it comes to absorption costing, you have to make an adjustment for the under or over absorption as well. Okay, folks, that's a really important thing to remember. I'll just uh, put a working note over here. Working one over or under absorption. So how can it be calculated? We know the equation, right? It's basically the absorbed overheads minus the actual overheads. You know what, the actual overheads is key, so I'm just going to put that above. Okay, folks, there we go. I'll just uh, copy paste the periods over here. So, how much overheads are the actual overheads? Well, it's kind of a simple equation. All you have to do is you just have to type in the actual output for the year. I'll open a bracket as well. 16,000 divided by 2, right, for the six-month period, times 20. Okay, folks, what is 20? 20 is basically the fixed overhead uh overhead absorption rate or something, right? Overhead cost. Yeah, fixed overhead cost. Okay, folks. So why are we only taking into account the fixed overhead cost? Because variable overhead cost varies according to the activity levels, isn't it? However, fixed overhead costs are rigid. Okay, folks, that's basically why we're 
adjusting for just the fixed overhead production cost. So remember that. So uh, what else? Uh, for the next period, it will be the same kind of the same equation itself, I believe. Yeah, it will be. And what about the absorbed overheads? What is the equation here? We need to take into account of the closing inventory majorly. Okay, folks, so how much is the clo closing inventory exactly? I don't have it typed in separately, so I'll just rewrite the equation once again. Closing inventory would be, uh, where was the question? One second. Yeah. And closing, uh, closing inventory, sorry, the production, right? Yeah. Uh, the actual production was 16,000 units per annum or normal output was 16,000 uh, units per annum. And then uh, the budgeted production was 8,500 and 7,000. Okay, folks, remember that. So for my terminology error, so this is basically 8,500 times 20. This will be 7,000 times 20. And then we calculate the difference, isn't it? All right. I'll just format it a bit, bit. There we go. You can format things in any manner. Okay, folks, this is not the FR exam, so therefore you don't have to follow a specific format as such. Okay, folks, in the PM exam, the format can be anything as long as it's understandable, easily understandable by the examiner. Okay, folks, so just keep that in mind. So we have, uh, for the first six months, we have uh, a negative 10,000, isn't it? What does that indicate? It basically indicates that the actual overheads were 160,000. However, the, you know, we will uh, we have absorbed uh, 170,000, isn't it? So that is, is it over absorption or under the uh, under absorption? It is over absorption, isn't it? Uh, because we you know absorbed too much than the actual overheads, it's, uh, which should have uh, been the case. And uh, for the next six month period, it's actually the uh, it, it was actually under absorption. Okay, folks. So if it's positive value, if you apply the same, if, if you apply the equation actual minus absorbed and you get a negative value, then it is over absorption. And if it's a positive value, it is under absorption. Why exactly is that? Because if we have over absorbed, then we have to deduct the, uh, the adjustment should be a deduction, right? But if it is under absorbed, the adjustment should be an addition. Okay, folks, that's basically the overall idea. Uh, and I will just include this particular amount over here. There we go. <clears throat> All right, so this could get you more marks in the exam. We don't have any mark allocation as of now, but since this is an example question, but if it was the actual exam, you will get a good amount of marks for this particular calculation. Okay, folks? And this would give me my gross profit, isn't it? There we go. How much would my gross profit be? Well, the uh, amount is already given here, so I just need to uh, sum up, right? No, not, not exactly. Okay, folks, so I'll just calculate this as like this, one minus this, minus this, there we go. Or should it be added? No, this is fine. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'll just copy paste this over here. Did we get the right gross profit? It's 507 and 548, which is the right answer, isn't it? Simple as that. So uh, we removed that one. This, these amounts will still remain the same. We don't have to retype it, thanks to CBE. Now I just recalculate the equation, isn't it? It's basically this amount minus this one minus this one. Simple as that. Copy paste the equation and you'll get the right answer, 221 and 234 thousand, isn't it? Simple as that. Okay, folks, so that's basically how you calculated using the absorption method. So you understood the difference here, right? So in, uh, in when it comes to marginal costing, uh, we calculated the contribution and then deducted the fixed cost to get the uh, profits. However, when it comes to absorption costing, we make an adjustment for over and under absorption again. And, you know, we don't have to separately deduct, or we don't have to find the contribution in this particular case, it's gross profit and then profit as simple as that okay folks so 
that's basically all about this particular question. If you have any questions at all, feel free to reach out. Now, moving on to the next aspect, ABC costing method. So speaking more on activity-based costing, why exactly is there an activity-based costing? First of all, let's understand that, shall we? There is a demerit or a disadvantage from using the traditional method of costing that is absorption costing. You know what that is? Well, uh, I'll show you that. I'll demonstrate that in a particular example so that you can easily understand it. So folks, imagine that you and I are going into a restaurant. Okay, folks, you went there to have a coffee, a cup of coffee, espresso, cappuccino, whatever you like. And I had a pizza. Okay, folks. So let's understand things cost-wise. What is what would be the uh, uh, the price of a coffee and a pizza? Well, let's assume one dollar for a coffee, and maybe uh, eight dollars for a pizza. Of course, that may not be the actual rate. I'm just assuming things. Okay, folks. So. Uh, let's say that, of course, we're both going, both going into the particular restaurant together, so eventually we will have to split the bill, isn't it? So uh, the total bill would be $9, right? And we are splitting the bill equally. Okay, folks, if we split the bill equally, how much would that be? That would be $4.5 per person, isn't it? Not 48 Five dollar per person. Now tell me something, guys. Is this fair to you? I don't think so, isn't it? Because you had you just had a cup of coffee for one dollar, and you're paying four point five dollar, isn't it? And that's not necessarily fair to you, isn't it? So this is what we do when it comes to overheads in absorption costing. Okay, folks. So using the absorption costing method. We are assigning overheads in an unfair manner. Okay, folks? So the particular department or product may only be consuming, let's say, $1 worth of overheads, but we may assign them with $4.5. How is that possible? Well, think of the overhead absorption rate. It's, we're taking the total overheads, right? The entire total overheads and dividing it by, uh, with the budgeted activity level, isn't it? So if we just use that as the basis, then what's going to happen is, you know, if you only had one cup of coffee, you're still going to pay $4.5. However, let's talk it from uh, the concept of ABC costing. The concept of ABC costing is basically this. So instead of you paying $4.5 per person, you can just pay $1 and I'll pay the rest. Okay, folks, so in, in uh, using the ABC principles, we're going to look at the driving factors, okay, folks? So we're going to look at why exactly is the $9, $9, or what exactly is the major proportion of the $9? I'll identify it as $8, $8 relate to pizza. Who had the pizza? I did, so I have to pay for $8. And uh, you, you just had a cup of coffee, so you'll, get, you'll just have to pay $1 for that, okay, folks? So this is the principle behind ABC and how it's different from absorption costing. If it was absorption costing, then you would have had to pay $4.5 for your coffee. Whereas, uh, you know, if it's ABC, then you just have to pay a dollar, which is the accurate value, isn't it? So that's basically the principle. Okay, folks, so ABC, which is the modern costing technique, gives you more accurate overheads compared to absorption costing. Okay, folks, that's basically the overall idea. So how is that done? Let's take a look at the practical, uh, you know, case when it comes to the ABC method, shall we? Activity-based costing is the method of costing which involves identifying the cost of the main support activities and the factors that drive the cost of each activity. In absorption costing, we're just taking the total overheads and dividing it to each, uh, dividing it by with the activity level, uh, a common activity level for all cost centers, isn't it? However, in, uh, in activity-based costing, what we're going to do is we're going to identify the driving factors. Okay, folks? What exactly drives a particular cost? Well, before that, we have to categorize it into something called as 
cost pools as well. Okay, folks. So each cost will be categorized. Each overhead cost will be categorized into a cost pool and an absorption basis is calculated for each individual cost pool. Okay, folks. So to put it in a very simple manner, ABC just focuses on the driving factors of the cost and allocates cost in a bit more accurate basis compared to absorption costing. So remember that. So let's understand the steps then. Now, uh, step one is to identify the major cost in incurring activities within a business, right? So first of all, we identify those. And the second step is to identify cost drivers. Okay, folks, so we, we're asking ourselves the question. Okay, I have this particular uh, cost in my business, but what exactly is the driving factor behind the cost? I asked myself that question, okay, folks? And after identifying that, I will collect the cost of each activity and categorize them into cost pools. Cost pools are just some, uh, just a category of cost in relation to a particular driving activity, okay, folks? So that's basically all there is to it. And uh, now what I do is I'm gonna charge support overheads to products on the basis of their usage or activity. What's the idea here, guys? So uh, we're just, uh, you know, kind of some, it's kind of similar to reapportioning the, uh, reapportioning the service uh, cost centers to production cost centers. That's basically all there is to it. So all the support overhead activities will be, uh, will be reassigned to each product based on the usage of the activity. And uh, ultimately we calculate an overhead absorption rate, right? We still call it the overhead absorption rate for each cost pools. What are cost pools again? It's an activity which consumes resources for which overhead costs are identified and allocated. Okay, folks, it's basically a categorization. In absorption costing, we call it cost centers, but in activity-based costing, we call it cost pools. That's basically it. But the categorization would be a bit more vast. Okay, folks, we're not taking, at the, taking a look at the total things. So there should be a cost driver for each cost pool, and the term activity and cost pools can are often used interchangeably as well. Okay, folks, so... Activity cost pool. So yeah, that's basically the overall idea. And uh, yeah, so of course, you will only understand things once you look at some examples, isn't it? So let me give you an example here. Let's take machining costs. Okay, folks. So what is the driving factor behind machining costs? The driving factor would be the machining hour per unit, isn't it? Similar for component cost as well. The, num uh, the more the number of components, the higher the number of component cost, isn't it? And same goes for setup cost as well. The more uh, number of production setups, the more setup cost there would be. The more uh, number of customer orders, the more packaging cost would be as well, isn't it? So you, you understand the difference now, right? Because when it comes to the absorption costing, we just had one category, which is overheads. That's basically it. And we just calculate the overhead absorption rate and you know multiply it with the number of units. That's sim as simple as that. But here, we are categorizing the overhead into various cost pools. Okay, folks, the first cost pool would be uh, machining cost, then, and then we have component cost, setup cost, packing cost, etc. There are several other items as well. Okay, folks, so this is what happens in ABC costing. So, uh, a quick comparison is given here <clears throat> uh, between the traditional method, but before that, let me just uh, check something. There we go. Okay, uh, so when it comes to traditional absorption costing, it assumes that overhead expenditure is related to direct labor cost, uh, direct labor hours, machine hours, or production units, isn't it? We use a common basis for all overheads. However, this assumption is no longer reliable in many companies. Why? Because now we have a lot of complex organizational structures. Okay, folks, there would be a variety of categories of uh, overhead cost, and all of these over overhead costs cannot be uh, in relation to uh, the labor hours or machine hours. Okay, folks, which is why now we have absorption costing. Using ABC to allocate overhead costs will lead to very different values of overheads allocated per unit. And these values are more accurate compared to absorption costing. Okay, folks, so remember that particular key point as well. So what are the advantages? Well, first of all, more accurate cost information, as we discussed, uh, it identify ways to reduce overhead cost in the long term. This will enable managers to make better decisions particularly in respect of pricing and marketing activities. What's the idea here, guys? So in ABC costing, we are looking into the driving factors of the cost, isn't it? So if we have identified what drives the cost, then we could take initiatives to 
uh, you know, reduce that cost to a certain extent, isn't it? Or in order to make that particular driving factor in a bit more efficient manner, isn't it? So that's basically the overall idea. Okay, folks. And then what else? <clears throat> and yeah, if we are able to save cost, then ultimately the selling price can be reduced if needed, right? Uh, which can, you know, uh, help us in selling the product a bit more. Because if we lower the selling price, then the demand would increase, right? So that's basically the idea. In absorption costing, as the profitability of a product would be overstated, the company's marketing efforts is likely to direct it towards maximization of the sale of the product with lesser emphasis on other products. What's the idea here, guys? So, you know, it'll be difficult, like if the uh, profitability of the product is overstated using absorption costing, it would be difficult to market that particular product because, you know, if we have lesser, uh, a low, lower selling price, then, you know, we, we can get a competitive advantage when it comes to the industry, isn't it? So it'll be easy for us to do our marketing activity. It'll be easy to sell the product, okay, folks, due to its increased demand. However, uh, you know, absorption costing kind of, uh, kind of uh, you know, overstates the profitability, right? And therefore, it may not be that, I would say, uh, it, it may not be that, uh, you know, uh, we may have to put extra effort in marketing to sell that particular product if it's overpriced, isn't it? That's basically the idea. And then, uh, in addition, as the resulting selling price will be less uh, than is required fully require overheads and yield, of, uh, and, a and yield a satisfactory profit, the market will perceive the product to be particularly attractive. Well, the overall idea is kind of similar to the first point itself, right? If the cost is more accurate, then we can determine a more, you know, sellable selling price. Okay, folks, that's basically the overall idea. ABC provides much better insights into what drives the overhead cost. Okay, we've already discussed that. So, ABC recognizes that overheads are not all related to volume. It also identifies activities and costs that do not add values as well. So not all, uh, you know, ABC has that particular concept that, you know, not all overhead costs are related to the volume of activity, isn't it? So there are specific other driving factors as well. So we are able to identify those factors and relate to, related to certain cost pools, right? And more and about that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, if you're able to identify a driving factor, you can take initiatives to uh, eliminate the non-value adding activities. And uh, we can also, make things a bit more efficient to a certain extent. Okay, we'll take initiatives to, uh, you know, reduce the cost uh, by, by you know, thinking of various, uh, various things that can minimize the driving factors itself. Okay, folks, that's basically the overall idea. It can be applied to all overheads, not just production overheads. Okay, folks, not, we're not only focusing on the production overhead, but everything. But what are the disadvantages to? It will be of limited benefit if the overheads are primarily volume related or if the overheads are a small proportion uh, of the overall cost. So, identifying the driving factors of cost, taking initiatives, all these things will incur a lot of cost and management effort as well, isn't it? So, if the total overheads are a small proportion of the total cost of the product, then doesn't make any sense, isn't it? The cost would exceed benefit of implementing ABC method, isn't it? That's basically the idea here. And uh, in ABC, it is impossible to allocate all overhead costs to specific activities because for some activities, the, uh, see, when it comes to the driving factors, it's not that easy to identify one. Okay, folks, for the examples that we've looked at, it may be kind of easy, but there are a variety of activities that happen within organizations and identifying the driving factors of each of those could be a bit difficult. Sometimes we may even identify more than one driving factors as well. So we may have to judgmentally determine which is the actual one, isn't it? So all these things can make things a bit more difficult. That's it. And what else? The choice of both activities and cost drivers may be inappropriate. You know, sometimes you know, we may identify the wrong driving factor as well. That's also a possibility, right? And it can be more complex to explain to the stakeholders of the costing exercise as well. So not, not the stakeholders of the organization, guys. We're talking about the stakeholders of the costing exercise itself. Who all are, you know, it's kind of uh, difficult to explain these complex things to uh, people who may not be familiar with the ABC concept, isn't it? That's basically the overall idea here. And the benefit obtained from ABC method might not justify the cost. Okay, folks, so we're talking about situations. Not all situations are like this, but 
you know, uh, if 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 we are talking about situation like we looked earlier, for example, the if the overhead is a small proportion compared to the uh, total cost, then you know the cost can exceed benefit, isn't it? That's basically the idea here. In some situation, ABC does not provide a very different information from the traditional absorption costing. If that is the case, yet again, it's not really beneficial to implement ABC within the organization, isn't it? So that's basically the overall idea. So I've been saying ABC, ABC for quite some time now. So let's understand how the process works with some calculations, shall we? So what is the first thing that we should do? Read the requirements, isn't it? So what is the requirement here? We have to calculate the production cost per unit of table and of cupboard if the company uses traditional absorption costing and the overheads are recovered on a direct labor hour basis. So first of all, we have to use absorption costing method and we have to uh, absorb the overheads using uh, labor hour, labor hours, isn't it? And what else? We have to also calculate the production cost per unit of table and cupboard company if, sorry, cupboard if the company uses ABC as well, which is basically calculating production cost per unit using ABC. And we have to comment on the reasons for the differences in the production cost per unit between the two methods and what are the implications of management of using an ABC system instead of an absorption costing system. Okay, that seems to be quite straightforward information. Now let's, uh, sorry, quite straightforward requirement. Now let's have a look at the uh, question, shall we? Cobalt makes and sells two products, table and cupboard. The direct cost of production are $12 for one unit of table and $24 per unit of cupboard. Information relating to annual production and sales are as follows. We have annual production sales, uh, uh, production and sales provided to us. So we are assuming in this question that everything that we produced is being sold. And what else? Uh, we have the direct labor hour per unit, number of orders, number of batches, number of setups per batch and special parts per unit as well, isn't it? Okay, so always focus on the unit of measure, guys. Okay, folks, for example, we have, uh, you know, uh, number of setups per batch, not units, isn't it? So we may have to convert it into units as well. So yeah, we will look into that, but what else? The information in relation to annual production and sales is as follows. We have setup cost, we have special parts handling cost, other material costs, some of the cost drivers are also given, uh, order handling, other overheads. We have the total overheads given to us, which is 432,000 as well, isn't it? And uh, other overheads do not have any identifiable cost driver. And in an ABC system, these overheads would be recovered on a direct labor hour basis. So we have to use direct labor hour for total overheads, sorry, sorry other overheads, isn't it? So remember that. Well, for total overheads as well when it comes to absorption costing. So let's do this particular calculation using absorption costing first of all, shall we? So I'm just going to go uh, to this particular tab. There we go. <clears throat> so uh, what should be my heading? Oh, well, my heading should just be absorption costing for now. So. Under absorption costing, what should I do? What all information do I have, guys? I just, first of all, need to calculate the overhead absorption rate, isn't it? So I have the total overheads with me. There's no categorization as such, you know, that needs to be done. There's no cost center information or anything as such provided. So we don't need to do that. So we just need to absorb the overheads. Okay, folks. So uh, first of all, uh, we need to calculate the full, yeah, production cost per unit, right? So we need to also include the direct cost. So what are the direct cost of both tables as well as cupboards as well? Is that provided to us? Let's have a look at the question once again. Yes, it's provided over here, isn't it? The direct cost of production is $12 for one unit of table and 24 for cupboard, isn't it? So I'll just type 12 and 24. These are all, all values will most probably be in dollars. So I'm, I'll just, you know, provide this particular sign over here, dollar per unit. 
<clears throat> okay, so now let's calculate the overheads, shall we? I'll just provide a working note over here. So, how will we calculate the overheads in absorption costing? Kind of simple, really, isn't it? We have to first of all take the total overheads. Why did I always write hertz, I wonder? There we go. And this is basically how much? 432,000, right? 432,000. Always measure, always mention the unit of measure. And what else do we have? Uh, we need the budgeted activity level as well, isn't it? Which is basically labor hours. Okay, folks, for as per the requirement, we have to take labor hours as the basis for uh, calculating the overhead absorption rate, isn't it? So do we have the labor hours provided to us? We have the direct labor hour per unit, isn't it? And we also have the total number of units that we produce and sell, isn't it? So all we have to do is we just have to multiply these two amounts and these two amounts and add them together. Okay, folks, so I'll just quickly write the equation. Budgeted activity would be equal to 1 times 24,000 plus 1.5 times, how much was it? 24,000 itself, right? Yeah, 24,000. Yep, there we go. So this is basically my budgeted activity. So my overhead absorption rate would be total overheads divided by budgeted activity, which is 1.56. Okay, folks, I'll just reduce it to two decimal places. There we go. So now what do we have to do? Now, we need to calculate the overheads for each of these units, isn't it? So, my overheads for each of these units would be, what is the labor hour per unit of table? It's basically 1, so equal to 1.57 times 1. And for cupboard, this would be 1.5 times 1.17, isn't it? Simple as that. I'll just link these numbers. There we go. And this should be my production cost. All right, folks. Now, let's check if this is the right answer, shall we? And the right answer is over here. Full production cost was 19.2 and 37 point, sorry, 34.8, isn't it? So let's understand what went wrong here, shall we? It's uh, this is kind of interesting because that's one of the advantages of uh, CBE and one. I would say you can just simply correct the equation really easy. But uh, yeah, so I believe the equation went wrong in this particular area. The total budgeted overheads is 432,000, but the budgeted direct labor hours were 60,000, isn't it? So how did I get to 76,000 then? Well, I just added one additional zero here, isn't it? So if I remove that, everything should be fine. See, this is it. Okay, folks, this is one of the, uh, you know, I would say crucial things that you need to check once you are done with the answer. Always uh, check the number of zeros and everything just to just to make sure that you're avoiding any silly mistake that can completely change the answer. Okay, folks. However, let's assume that this was the case in the exam. Okay, folks. Let's assume that, uh, you know, I had stated the wrong number and this was the answer. So, since you have already provided all the, uh, you know, equations and everything, now the examiner can understand that you have used the right method, isn't it? And but you will get marks and you will get marks for that. 
So there's a rule known as the own figure rule when it comes to correcting the exam. Okay, folks. So uh, even if your final answer is like wrong, as mentioned over here, if the method is fine, okay, folks, if, if the examiner looks at these values and if, if, if the examiner looks at these, uh, you know, calculations and understand that you have used the right approach, but you just added one additional zero, then you may not get the, get the complete marks, but you will still get the majority of the marks since you use the right method. Okay, folks, so that's basically uh, one thing that I want to point out. There we go. I'll just, yeah, now it should be fine, right? 19.2 and 34.8. Yeah, simple as that. Okay, folks. So that's basically the uh, answer using the absorption costing method. Is the question over? No, not really, isn't it? So we need to also calculate it using the ABC method. So how would that go? So uh, I'm just going to quickly look at the question. I, can't, I guess we can just copy paste all of these until this particular portion. There's the overheads that would be different, right? Totally, there we go. Well, again, copy paste the working notes. We won't be taking the total overheads here. Okay, folks, so what we have to do is we have to calculate uh, the overheads for each cost pool, isn't it? So how many cost pools do we have? We have one, two, three, four, five cost pools over here, isn't it? For each of these, we should calculate a separate, uh, what do you call it? A, a separate abs overhead absorption rate. Now, let's do that, shall we? So, I'll first of all calculate it for the setup costs. It'll basically be overhead and then this and then this, okay? You can use any other format as well if you if you wish to. So, no worries on that. So, what is this total setup cost? Seventy three two hundred, isn't it? Seventy three two hundred. There we go. And what should be the budgeted activity level? So, the budgeted activity level will not be the labor hours. Instead, it should be the cost driving uh, cost driving factor, isn't it? What is the cost driving factor over here? number of setups and how many setups are there in total we have the number of setups per batch and the num uh, number of batches as well isn't it so all we have to do is we just have to multiply these two amounts over here and add them together okay folks as simple as that so 1 times 12 plus 240 times 3 i'll just write the equation over here 1 times 12 plus 240 times 3 and the, this particular equation is still relevant, so we get the right absorption rate. And I'll just copy paste this again for the next item. What is the next item? Special parts handling, isn't it? Sounds kind of wrong, but still. Yeah, uh, moving on to the cost. Annual cost is 60,000, isn't it? Yeah. Make sure I have the right number of zeros this time. Yep. Uh, what about the driving factor? It's the number of special parts, isn't it? So uh, what exactly is the total number of special parts here? We have the special parts per unit, isn't it? So what is the total number of special parts? It will be 1 times 24,000 plus 4 times 24,000, isn't it? There we go. plus 4 times 24,000. It's 4, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it'll be 120,000 and my overhead absorption rate will be 0.5. There we go. Moving on to the next part. What is the next cost? Other materials handling. Okay. What is the overheads? 63,000. Budgeted activity would be number of batches, isn't it? How many number of batches are there? There is no unit per batch, so I guess it's just this, uh, 12 plus one, uh, 240. 
that'll give me 21.88. Simple as that. It's plus, isn't it? Yeah, there we go. 250, yeah, this should be the right answer. And what else? Other, sorry, order handling. I need to first of all copy paste this over here. And then rename it to order handling. Nineteen eight hundred, and this uh, cost driver would be the number of orders as per the question, isn't it? Do we have the number of orders over here? Yes, we do. It's ten plus one forty, one fifty, isn't it? So, but we still have to showcase the equation. So I'm just going to write this. Should be plus, not times. There we go. One thirty two, and finally we have the other overheads, right? Yeah. What is the driving factor here? Do we have that in the question? Most definitely, yes. It's basically the, I'll just write the equation first of all, 126, sorry, 216,000. And the driving factor here is the direct labor hours, isn't it? So do we have the direct labor hours? Per, we have the direct labor hours per unit and I guess we can copy paste the equation from over here, isn't it? We don't have to type everything again because we can be lazy when it comes to the CB environment, isn't it? So I'll just copy paste it over here. There we go. All right, now what? Is the question over? No, not really. Each of these items should be apportioned to both table and then uh, to the other one. What was it again? Yeah, uh, to table and then to uh, cupboard. Okay, folks, remember that. All right, so let's let's do that. Let's see how that works. So how can we present that? Hmm. You know what? I can just uh, copy paste this over here and then over here. There we go. So how much uh, would be the number of units? All I have to do is I have to take out the number of uh, units from over here. How many? How much uh, setups does table have? Uh, one one unit of table have? Let's see. It's basically on a, given on a batch basis, isn't it? So do we have the number of batches? Yep, for each. Okay, so we have 12 batches. And then we have to multiply this. With this one, isn't it? Times 12 times one, there's just one batch, isn't it? And for cupboard, there were three batches and each batch is contained 240 units, isn't it? Sorry. Uh, three setups and each setup contained uh, each, uh, sorry three setups per batch and then uh, you know how many mat batches were there 240 batches in it so it'll be 72,000 over here all right well you know what we can create a separate table right so I'll just copy paste this particular not copy cut this over here from over here there we go Setup cost is done. What about the next one? We have special parts handling. And how should we apportion it? Basis the number of special parts, isn't it? How many special parts uh, you know the the this table have? One and then four, isn't it? So I'll just this take this value. Times one. And how many units were there? Twenty-four thousand, isn't it? Times twenty-four thousand. There we go. And then again. And then it was four, isn't it? So point five times four times 24,000. Yep. What else? The next item was other materials handling, isn't it? What's the cost driving factor? Batches, isn't it? It will be 12 and 240. So the absorption rate 
times 12. For this one, the absorption rate would be 250 times 240. There we go. All right, what else? There should be more factors. Uh, yeah, other material, other hand, order handling, not other materials. Uh, this would be number of orders, right? Yeah, number of orders, 10 and 140, isn't it? So equal to, for tables, it will be 132 times 10. And for cupboards, it would be 132 times 140. And the next aspect is other overheads, which is kind of straightforward, isn't it? Equal to this value times 1 times 24,000. And for cupboard, it will be 3.6 times 1.5, which is the hour per unit times 24,000. So now let's calculate the full or let's calculate the overheads. Okay, folks. The sum of all these values. 103. Okay, so I'll just remove the decimal places to avoid any confusion. There we go. So now we have the total overheads, right? But we don't have the overheads per unit, isn't it? Because we need the overheads per unit to be filled in over here. Where was it? Yeah, over here, isn't it? So let's calculate the overheads per unit. How exactly is that done? Well, we have the total overheads. So all we have to do is we have, you have to divide it with the number of units, isn't it? Which is 24,000 for each. So overhead per unit would be, again, it's red for some reason. Yeah, there we go. This value divided by this, 4.33 and 13.67, isn't it? So I'll just link it to my main answer. Control B. And this will get me my, what, full production cost, isn't it? I'll just, I can just copy paste the same thing over here. There we go. 16.33 and 37.67. Is our answer correct? 16.33 and 37.67, as simple as that. Okay, folks. So, uh, now, is there a difference between these two? Most definitely, yes, isn't it? And remember, guys, uh, ABC method always gives the more accurate answer. Okay, folks, so remember that compared with ABC. Because in ABC, as you can see here, more, uh, more cost is allocated to tables compared to the ABC method, isn't it? So ABC is more accurate, so we're going to be using that for complex organizations. Okay, folks, remember that. So uh, that's basically how, as to how you do ABC questions. We will be practicing some more questions as well. And with practice, you'll get the hang of, you know, how to do these things in a bit more, uh, you know, efficient and effective manner when it comes to the exam. Okay, folks, so don't worry about that. So uh, that's basically all about this particular question. If you have any, you know, if you have any questions of your own, then feel free to reach out to me uh, regarding that. And uh, the question is not over. There are a few more things, right, uh, regarding commenting on this because, this is uh, th uh, in this particular exam, you're not just expected to calculate things. There is also the theoretical part as well. You have to comment on the numbers as well. In order to comment on the numbers, you have to understand the numbers, isn't it? So remember that. And uh, the, uh, the next question was, uh, identify the reasons for the differences in the production cost per unit between the two methods. What were the reasons? Let's have a look. The reasons for the differences in production cost per unit between the two methods. Under the cost, uh, costing method, absorption costing method, uh, it assumes that all of the overheads were driven by labor hours and as a result, cupboard received 1.5 times the production uh, overhead of the table. Okay, so we are assuming a common overhead, isn't it? We know that. What else? However, this method uh, of absorption is not appropriate. Why not? The overheads are driven by 
a number of different factors, isn't it? Uh, there are five activity costs, each one has its own cost driver, isn't it? And by taking into account, we end up with much more accurate production overheads compared uh, co overhead cost per unit. What was the idea here, guys? In activity-based costing, we identified that there was a number of other driving factors. It wasn't just labor hours, isn't it? So since we are considering a number of other factors, we were able to get a bit more accurate picture of the overheads, isn't it? That's basically the idea. Using ABC, cost per unit of a cupboard is significantly higher. Why exactly was that? This is because the cupboard is much more of a complex product than table. As a result of the complexity, the cupboard has received more than three times the overhead of table. Why did cupboard get a more uh, a higher proportion of cost in ABC? Because it was a bit more complex, isn't it? There were a number of other factors involved. Even if you look at the number of batches for cupboard, it was like really great. And you know, there are a few other factors as well. So uh, yeah, it's, it's basically due to these things. The accurate allocation is important because the production overhead is a large proportion of the overall cost, isn't it? So that's that's basically another factor that we identify. If we compare uh, the overheads with, uh, one second. Yeah, there we go. So if we compare the uh, overheads with direct costs, as you can see here, it's a, it's a, it's not like greater, I would say, but it is still a significant portion, isn't it? So uh, let's let's just calculate the percentage figure to get a bit more understanding, shall we? Thirty-seven percent and thirty-one percent. Okay, that's a, that's a significant uh, amount. Like it's not like five percent or two percent, isn't it? It's more like thirty percent of the total cost, total production cost is overheads itself. So, which is why uh, using ABC would give you a bit more of an accurate set of information. So, that's basically it. Now, moving on. So, what is the next requirement again? What are the implications of management of using ABC system instead of an absorption costing system? We, I think we already discuss that when we discuss the advantages and disadvantages, isn't it? Because, uh, you know, we know that it helps us in uh, assessing the overall profitability in a bit more accurate manner, right? We, we would be able to focus more on the pricing and marketing activities thanks to ABC, right? So there are a few other areas men mentioned over here. Pricing is something that we discuss. Uh, decision making, this should, be, this should also be improved. For example, research, uh, production and sales effort can be uh, directed towards the most profitable product. We're getting more infor more accurate information regarding costing of the products. Therefore, we will be getting uh, information regarding the profitability or more accurate information regarding the profitability of each of the products that we have. And if we have that information, then it'll be easy for us to focus more towards the profitable products rather than the non-profitable ones, isn't it? Simple as that. And then per uh, performance management is another, uh, also another uh, aspect. We can improve performance you know, by focusing on the right products and uh, by having more accurate information. And sales strategy is something that we already looked at as well. Okay, folks, these are all very basic things. Okay, folks, very basic things. There's nothing, uh, you know, more that is deep dived into it. We've already covered all of these, all of these concepts throughout the set of topics that we just discussed. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. So that's basically all about this particular topic. So, we will of course be looking into more about activity-based costing in the upcoming sessions as well because ABC principles are like really, really, really popular uh, topic throughout the PM sessions. Uh, and even if you go to the advanced level, you know, you'll learn some more advanced topics in relation to it as well. But uh, yeah, before going into that, let's have a, before going into the next few sessions, let's, let's have a, a quick look at some questions uh, that can come up in the exam. Okay, folks, so let's start with this one. How is overhead absorption rate calculated? Well, that's kind of an easy question, isn't it? Because we already learned it and we know which is the right option already. It's basically budgeted overheads divided by budgeted activity level. Answer is option C, simple as that. But the next one won't be that simple. So let's have a look, shall we? Uh, what would be the profit for the financial period using marginal costing? 
well, the opening inventory is greater than uh, closing inventory. So we know that uh, marginal costing will provide a greater profit, isn't it? And uh, yeah, absorption costing profit is already given to us, which is 250,000 as well. But do we have any information at all regarding the fixed overhead cost or anything like that? No, not really, isn't it? We don't have that information, isn't it? So it is impossible to calculate without more information. So this is a you know examiner's way of uh, tricking you. Okay, folks, so will be a bit confused. Impossible to calculate? Would that be possible in an exam? They will always provide the answer, right? So you may waste your time thinking, you know, well, how is there any other way or is there any other method that I don't know of? You have to be really, really, really confident when it comes to tackling the question. Okay, folks. Otherwise, uh, you know, you may just choose choose the right uh, wrong option itself. Okay, folks. So I've told this to many of my students as well. Okay, folks, if you are Choosing an option, stick with it confidently. If you're not confident enough, then you know there's an increased chance that you'll get the wrong answer. Even if you know the concept, you may get the wrong answer. Why? Because you you lacked confident in what you've learned. Okay, folks. So be confident in what you've learned and then tackle the question. So uh, this particular question was kind of impossible to calculate. So I'm just going to move on to the next one. The overhead absorption rate for product alpha is four dollar per machine hour each unit of alpha requires three machine hours inventories of product alpha last uh, last period were opening inventory is 2400 and closing inventory is 2700 compared with the marginal costing profit for the period the absorption costing profit for alpha will be which of the following okay that's uh understandable uh, that's an understandable calculation. So, uh, do we have the enough have enough information? Yes, we have the change in inventory level, right? Which is basically three hundred to four hundred minus two seven hundred, and we have to multiply it with with what? With three? No, it has to be the overhead absorption rate per unit, isn't it? Do we have the overhead absorption rate per unit? Yes, we have. It's basically four times three, isn't it? Which gives us twelve. That will be 3600, right? Is it higher or lower? It will most definitely be higher, isn't it? Why? Because the closing inventory is more than opening inventory. Okay, folks, that's basically why. So just remember that particular point. These are all things that we learn, isn't it? However, sometimes we tend to confuse, get confused. Sometimes, you know, some students, what uh, they used to do was they used to just multiply 300 with 4 instead of, you know, multiplying it 4 times 3. So, uh, these are basically some basic things that you have to keep in mind. Carefully read the question, uh, believe in what you've learned, and then, you know, do the question. Okay, folks, so remember that. We cannot cancel out when it comes to these cancel, uh, calculation questions, right? So just keep that point in mind. Now, moving on to the next one. Which two of the following statements about activity-based costing are true? Okay, let's understand this. Activity-based costing is a form of absorption costing. Would you agree? I would agree. Okay, folks, so this could be a true statement. What about the next one? In a system of ABC, for costs that vary with production levels, the most suitable cost driver is likely to be direct labor hours or machine hours. Is that true? Most definitely yes. Why? Because, you know, both labor hours and machine hours are variable factors. Okay, folks, these two factors or these, these two activities change depending upon the number of units produced. Because if you're producing more units, then we would definitely use labor hours or machine hours to do that, isn't it? That's basically why. Okay, folks, so this is a true statement, which basically, you know, cancelled out, uh, you know, this would be our wrong option, isn't it? But however, you know, we can't just plainly leave it be. There could be some trick things, right? So let's, uh, let's quickly read through it. Implementation of ABC is unlikely to be cost effective when variable production costs are a low proportion of uh, total production cost. Does that make sense to you? No, not really. Because what we've learned is, uh, you know, if the overheads are a pro small proportion of the total production cost, then, you know, then it makes sense, right? Then it would be a true statement. But we're talking about variable production cost here. That doesn't really make sense at all. So I'm just going to leave it be. Uh, so yeah, these two are the right answers. What else? Moving on to the next one. The following sta statements have been made when making comparisons between Traditional absorption costing and activity-based costing. So is it true or false? That's basically what we have to answer here. Absorption costing uses 
volume as a basis for cost allocation and so tends to allocate too great a proportion of overheads to low volume products. That's not necessarily the case, isn't it? So I would say it's false because you know if it's too great a proportion, I'm sorry, if it's a too low volume products, then low proportion would be allocated as much as uh, as per my understanding. Uh, so it's a false. What about the second one? ABC has evolved as a response to the increase in support activities in modern uh, modern organizations. Is that true? Most definitely yes. Okay, folks. So organizations have become more complex, which is why we need more accurate cost information as compared to absorption costing, right? So that, which is why this is the this is a true statement. Okay, folks. Is it? Yes, it is. Okay, folks. That's basically the answer. Now moving on to the next one. ABC is felt to give more useful product costs than classic absorption costing with overhead absorbed on labor hours. Okay. In which of the four, uh, if which of the two, which, which of the following two apply? Okay, let's read out each of these. Overheads are more difficult to predict. Could that be a reason why ABC would give more useful product cost compared to absorption costing? Well, I will keep a pause on that, right? I can't really cancel out it yet, but yeah, I'll keep a pause on that. Overheads vary with many different measures of activity. Is that a reason why ABC is more useful than classic absorption costing? I would think so, isn't it? So I'll just take this off. What about the next one? Labor costs are a relatively minor proportion of total costs. If that is the case, then I am a bit doubtful on that. Okay, folks. So. I'll just keep a pause on it. Let's le read the next one. Cost drivers are difficult to identify. You know, I most definitely know that this is not an option, right? So I can just cancel it out. What about the first one? Overheads are difficult to predict. Well, if overheads are difficult to predict, then is ABC more useful than absorption costing? I don't really, isn't it? It doesn't really connect with each other, isn't it? So I don't think this is the right answer either, which leaves us with these two statements, okay, folks? So labor costs are relatively a minor proportion of uh, a minor proportion of total cost. What does that mean? Labor costs are direct costs, isn't it? If direct costs are a minor proportion of the total cost, that means that overhead is the major proportion, isn't it? Therefore, ABC would be more useful. So second option is correct. Okay. So yeah, that's basically why this is the right answer. Now moving on to the next one. Okay, so this one, again, we don't, we can't really cancel out on this one, right? We have to read each of these and understand. So let's read the first one. Uh, the following statements have been made about traditional absorption costing and activity-based costing. Which of these statements are true? First of all, implementing ABC is expensive and time-consuming. We most definitely know that this is a true statement, right? So one is most definitely there. If one is there, then I guess we can cancel out these two options, right? So it's either, and uh, you know, that effectively means that three is in the right option as well, isn't it? Okay, that, that was easy. And what about the second option? But yeah, let's re just read it any which ways. Traditional absorption costing may be used to set prices for products, but activity-based costing cannot. I don't see why not, right? There's no e reason for that. So this is a wrong statement. I guess the answer is one only. Is it one only? Yes, it is. But let's read the third line as well. Traditional absorption costing tend to allocate too many overheads to low volume products and not enough overheads to high volume products. It's actually the other way around. Okay, folks. So we tend uh, ABC, uh, traditional absorption costing tend to allocate too many overheads to high volume products and vice versa. Okay, folks. So remember that. And is that all the question? Yep, that's basically all the question that we have for this particular session. And that's all for this particular session overall. I will see you later in the next session where we will be learning something new. Okay, folks. So till then, this is Vishnu Vijay signing off.